You have a couple acting roles as well, don't you? Yeah, I was. I played the part of uh, Randolph Miller and Peter Bogdanovich's Daisy Miller when I, I was like twelve. Mm -hmm. And a uh, terrible movie. <laughs> Hello, people of the world. Welcome back to another episode of Sam Sessions. We're here in the Acoustic A room again at South Austin Music. Uh, we got a very special day today. You got the world's most mediocre interviewer in this chair here. And to my right, dear friend, James McMurtry. I can tell you, you're not the most mediocre interviewer because I've seen them all. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Uh, man, kind of starting right at the, the beginning here, I read that uh, your father, Larry, gave you your first guitar when you were seven. Yeah, I might have been younger. Uh, my mother didn't teach me how to play it till I was seven. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think he came back from a California trip and he had this little guitar and he gave me and Yeah, and uh, eventually my mother taught me how to tune it and actually play a chord or two. Right, right. I was curious, do you think you would have picked up guitar regardless? Probably. Uh, yeah, I wanted to be Johnny Cash when I was a kid. <laughs> so is he one of your bigger inspirations growing up? Well, yeah, when I was, uh, you know, first listening to music, uh, I was a you know, big Cash fan and then somebody introduced me to uh, the music of Chris Christopherson, and Christopherson was the first one that I that was introduced to me as a songwriter. Mm -hmm. I hadn't put any thought to where songs came from up to that point. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't care whether Johnny wrote his stuff or not. I just liked his voice and that Luther Perkins guitar, which I never mastered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You said your mom taught you how to play it at first. Was she a player? She played for a long time, and then she fell down and broke a finger or something and didn't set right. And, mm. and she just put the guitar in a, in a corner. Yeah, yeah. Until it was time to teach you. Yeah. So how long would you say you've been playing guitar if you started at about age seven? Uh, well, that, that would be about uh, 53 years. Yeah. So you were born in 62, correct? Mm-hmm. That's interesting. So you, I mean... Me being from Austin, I've seen a lot of change just being in my 20s. I can't imagine the amount of change that you've seen. Well, there's been more change here in Austin than, than most places. Right, of course. Yeah. And you live out in uh, Lockhart now, is that I correct? I live in Lockhart, yeah. We got priced out of Austin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's, a lot of people are. There seems to be a, you know, a lot of musicians moving out to Lockhart. Do you think there's something particular about that town that draws in the musicians that are moving out of Austin? Well, it's the last affordable real estate you can get and it's, it's just recently kind of gone out of sight for most people too right i mean it, it, lockhart was the last destination because it it doesn't route to anywhere you mm -hmm. know unless you're going to gonzalez or luling you know right for some reason it's not on the way to anywhere you know bastrop blew up because it's on the way to houston mm -hmm. and everything on the west side of town is it's kind of picturesque hill country well you know lockhart's up on this flat plateau between the you know, Colorado and San Marcos rivers is not, you know, it's an ag-based economy mm -hmm. and not, you know, not the kind of thing Austinites are looking for. Yeah. But yeah. It, it suits me fine. Yeah, I absolutely. I don't mind flat. <laughs> they, uh, they got a lot of good barbecue spots out there, don't they? Well, now they got good everything uh, except Asian food. They don't, we don't, we don't have enough Asians yet. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of, you know, the young people from Austin, but not just musicians, but chefs and you know club owners people like that are moving down there and there's a restaurant there called little trouble that's a spinoff of justine's in east oh. austin because one of the chefs from there no got kidding. enough of it went down there started his own shop that place is probably pretty killer huh it is i yeah. love well, justine's there's lots of them and there's loop and lil's pizza i mean okay. you, you gotta you gotta you know a town with a a pizza joint named after a couple of towns van zant characters mm-hmm you know, it's a natural place for us. Interesting. Well, that's cool. I'm glad you're uh, enjoying enjoying the time out there. Um, I'm obsessed with Austin, but I know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, people are getting priced out every single day. I got really lucky. I'm I'm in affordable housing, yeah. so I mean, it's it's tough out there. Otherwise, there's no way I could afford. Well, well now I mean, people are jumping all the way to Luling and Smithville mm -hmm. nowadays because mm -hmm. it's just you know spreading further out. Yeah, absolutely. So James, you've been described to me by more than one person and on many occasions is a very prolific writer. 
And I know that your father, Larry, was, uh, you know, a national novelist, um, wrote, you know, The Last Picture and uh, a few other books. I'm curious, when you were growing up, was it like drilled into your head that, you know, English was an important subject to study? Or Yeah, my, well, both my parents were educators at one time. Uh, my mm -hmm. dad taught creative writing. Uh, before he got a foothold in the screenwriting business, he made his living as a teacher. My mother was a professor her whole life, and she loved teaching. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, she taught uh, English Lit at the University of Richmond, Virginia. Uh, yeah. Uh, Larry got out of teaching as soon as he could because it, it was it was Vietnam era, and you know most of his students were trying to get out of the war, and he didn't mind that, but they were hard to teach because they didn't want to be taught. Right. And, uh, but uh, yeah, I was I was taught English was uh, liberal arts was a good mm -hmm. pursuit. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I'm not prolific like Larry was. Larry could not write. You know, I'd, I'd wake up to the sound of the typewriter and I'd go to sleep to it later at night. And, wow. But um, yeah, I, I don't write till I have to. I so I I saw that. Uh, I forgot exactly how you worded it, but it seems that. Sometimes having a deadline for you can be beneficial in your creation of writing. Sometimes it's the only way to get it done. I so prefer, I, I prefer not. I prefer it when I can just write a few songs. And, right, right. Yeah. A deadline kind of creates like a, a sense of pressure, I would imagine. So is it fair to say that you work better under pressure? Uh, sometimes I only work under pressure. I don't know that I was going to say better. You know, there, there's, there's some albums that I've done piecemeal, just a song or two. Mm -hmm. at a time and I like that better I don't like the pressure so much you know, when I was younger I had to have it I had to have the adrenaline now that kind of wears me out it's just mm -hmm. kind of daunting yeah yeah you know it's funny because you, be, you being the same age as my dad I know pretty well that life is pretty much always a series of just ups and downs and with the fact that you've released music through the majority of it I wonder if for you specifically looking back at your projects if the projects can reflect the ups and downs that you may have gone through through the years. They can, yeah. But mostly it's just, you know, one gig to the next, one record to the next. I, I never planned it out, really. Mm -hmm. I, I sort of look at the record business. There was an early video game called Frogger, mm -hmm. a two-dimensional thing. Mm -hmm. It's like every project is to get to the next Gatorback <laughs> before it sinks. You might never get across the creek, but you got to get to that next Gator. Mm -hmm. That's and you know, most you know, the record business changed during my time. I, when I made my first couple of records, the, the business model was you, you put out the record and you toured to support record sales in hopes that you would recoup your and production costs and then you'd make record royalties and you'd live off of that. Well, that never happened with me. My records were too expensive in the beginning mm -hmm. and they never recouped. So, you know, we learned pretty early on how to make a living off the road. Just, you mm -hmm. know, strip it down and keep, you know, stay in the van, don't go for the tour bus, you know, yeah, that kind of thing. And so I guess about, you know, 15, maybe 20 years ago, Napster came in and Spotify and they turned the whole business on its head mm -hmm. to where nobody's selling records and nobody's getting any royalties because the you know, streaming royalties and download royalties are nothing. Mm -hmm. So everybody's having to do it like we do, mm -hmm. get in the van. Um, and we, you know, now instead of putting out, instead of touring to support records, we put out records to support tours. Yeah. Because if we have a record out, the press will write about us and people will know we're coming to town. Mm -hmm. And hopefully they buy tickets. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like you spent a lot of time on the road. When you were first started touring, did you do you remember having nerves when you first started as opposed to now? Having what? Nerves, like feeling nervous before oh, yeah. shows well, and tours. I still get nervous, but uh, you still do get nervous. It's better if you do, otherwise you go to sleep up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, nerves will, will keep you uh, on your feet for sure. Yeah, I just need a little. You need a little bit of edge mm -hmm. out there, but. Uh, but, you know, it was different. You know, it used to, it was all cash economy. You got paid in cash because you had to pay your hotels in cash because nobody was going to take your checks out there. Mm -hmm. You know, and now most of the settles are check settles because the seats are sold on advanced credit card sales. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, we have, you know, interstate banks where we can deposit money. We don't have to do 
you know, money orders and send them to the office like we used to. It's certainly changing faster than, I mean, even I can keep up in my generation. I'm supposed to be able to keep up with all that. I, I still pay my rent with money orders, so. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's just the way it is sometimes. Um, I've noticed listening to your music that it's pretty rare for your songs to hit the, I guess, standard of three minutes, three and a half minutes. Generally, your songs last, you know, anywhere between four. I've even seen eight minute long songs. Is there a particular reason behind that? That's just uh, the length that I write for mm -hmm. the most part. Uh, I'll have a couple of them under four minutes, and that, that used to be crucial back when we, you know, when, when radio was a real deal. Mm -hmm. Radio is not as important anymore. Because you, you, you can write longer stuff. Radio would have a tough time, like playing your songs if it was over a certain amount, right? Yeah, because they got to have, you know, they want a full playlist, and you know, they, they want them under four. Mm -hmm. For the most part, but you know, then there's anomalies like Stephen King has a station in uh, Bangor, Maine, WKIT, mm -hmm. and he played Choctaw Bingo in all its nine-minute glory <laughs> uh, because well, first, first he tried Level Land because he heard it on the live record and that went over pretty good. That's that's five or six minutes, mm -hmm. but Maine is different. They'll try anything up there. Yeah. So he put uh, you know he put Choctaw Bingo on. They liked it. Then he played. We can't make it here, which for a while there, that made Bangor the biggest market for us because Maine at the time had lost 30,000 jobs to outsourcing, and that's kind of what the song was about. Wow. Yeah, speaking of, you know, that song being about people losing their jobs in Maine, I noticed that, uh, you know, a lot of the songs, they're in first person, a lot of your songs are in first person, but they're almost always about a character and not necessarily yourself. However, you do such a good job of going so deep into that character's mind, a lot of people don't even know that you're actually writing about a character rather than yourself. Yeah, and that's a problem <laughs> because, you know, people expect the, you know, that whatever the character's thinking is actually my opinion, mm -hmm. which it sometimes is, but you, know, you, you have to stay in character. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you're writing from the point of view of a character that doesn't agree with you yourself, you can't try to inject your own opinion into it unless you're really sneaky. Yeah. Because otherwise you break character and you got a sermon, mm -hmm. not a song. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting because I would wonder, like, is that a skill you developed over time, being able to get into the mind of a character? That's just fiction. Yeah. You know, my dad was a fiction writer where he wrote prose. I write fiction songs. Yeah, I was just watching, and, you know, it's it's crazy because I saw that. I mean, you have a song about someone uh, kind of going off the rails and killing their wife, and, you you know, you're still so deep into that person's mind that... <laughs> what is what? Yeah. That actually, yeah, Decent Man, I took mm -hmm. that. That's, that's a Wendell Berry short story. Right. I took that story from him, and I called him up and said, you want writer credit on this? He says, no, man, it's a different medium. <laughs> yeah. Have fun. With your last two uh, projects, you have uh, The Horses and the Hounds and The Complicated Game. Was Do one of those stick out to you as maybe more enjoyable, to the, like the creation of them was more enjoyable? or Neither of them were enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> but the results were good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you find any pleasure in your work, or is it does it feel like work a lot of times? Well, it does feel like work. I, I like the live show better. Mm -hmm. which, uh, I mean, I haven't. The last time I produced a record, I don't remember if that was any fun either. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, that was a long time ago. I, I don't. Uh, the, the studio, is, you know, they, those places are claustrophobic and dark, and I don't like to be in them for very long. Mm. The only part I really enjoy about recording is if you're singing through a really good vocal rig, mm -hmm. and you got phones on, and so you're sort of in this electronic sonic universe. Mm -hmm. And that's when the walls go away, and it's not claustrophobic anymore because you're, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's a good rig, you know, good mic, good preamps. It just sounds so much better than you believe you can sound, mm -hmm. and that's that's cool. Yeah, is there a a studio in a certain place that you've had the easiest time recording at? Or, well, I liked working with uh, Stuart Sullivan when he was right down here at Wire. When I, Wire was down there next to the Goodwill mm -hmm. for a long time. Now it's way on the east side. And I haven't really done much work out there. Um, but I got that's the one studio I kind of got comfortable in, mm -hmm. right? Because I, I that's that's where I produce my stuff. And uh, Reflection Studio in Charlotte, where we did the, the Where'd You Hide the Body record, that was unusual in that it, it felt you know, it was a big room and it, it kind of felt open and 
mm-hmm. not quite so cave-like. Uh, but other than that, I mean, uh, I mean, on this last record, I really like, you know, Ross had a good vocal thing. He had a, like a, a U67, I think it was, and I don't know what kind of pre's he had, but then, mm-hmm. you know, that made the whole sonic thing just, didn't matter what studio you're in if you're singing. Through. Knocked it out of the yeah, park. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, that's cool. You have a couple acting roles as well, don't you? Yeah, I was. Uh, I played the part of uh, Randolph Miller and Peter Bogdanovich's Daisy Miller when I, I was like twelve. Mm-hmm. And a uh, terrible movie. <laughs> <laughs> but I did have the experience of working with those really hot lights that they had back then. Yeah, people. Big old Panavision 35s. Mm-hmm. You know, full crew, all that. And then I had a bit part in Lonesome Dove in the miniseries. And it was, it was an interesting juxtaposition because on Daisy Miller, I used to hang out in the, in the cutting room because I really liked Verna Fields, who was the editor, and mm-hmm. her son Rick was the assistant. And, Back then, it was like you'd go in a cutting room. And there's like clips of film hanging from the walls, and they're working on these little machines, movieolas, which they, you know, they'd run the film through it, and the movie would come up on that little bitty screen here, and they'd be actually physically cutting film mm-hmm. to edit it. And um, so, the, you know, Lonesome Dove comes along. And it's it's VHS era, mm-hmm. and they shot it on 35, just like, and they it was shot on film. But they never developed the film. They ran the negative straight to hard drive. So it was edited on some kind of early Avid system with you know, multiple screens and you're just cutting between screens digitally. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, because that's saving, that's saving millions of dollars because they didn't have to develop all those miles of film for mm-hmm. an eight hour miniseries. But it, it was shocking to me because I thought, well, I'll, I'll go see what the cutting room's like, you know. And I go in there, and there's three guys gathered around computer screens, and, and there's no film hanging anywhere. <laughs> and I'm like, what happened? <laughs> of course, it was about 20 years between the two. So. I would ask, like, you know, how hard was it to trans- transition from being a musician to being in those acting roles? But it seems like you almost do more acting in your songwriting and singing than, you know, a cameo in a movie. You do. Um I'm not, yeah, I, I didn't work well around a camera. Mm-hmm. Anytime I got close to the camera, I got nervous. Um, so I, fortunately, I wasn't around the camera much. I was way off in the background sitting on a horse with these little bitty Korean steers that they got for for the herd. Yeah, yeah. You got a, you've had a residency at Compton Nuns Club for years. Is that right? Yeah, 2002 we started that. Oh, geez, so yeah. about two decades now. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. How's it been over there? Well, it's different now. I mean, now Austin's more of a tourist destination. Mm-hmm. You know, when we started out, it was music aficionados mm-hmm. and club regulars. Now, you know, you'll have tour buses coming in. People get off the bus, go get a drink or two, take selfies in front of the stage, get back on the bus. <laughs> it's all about saying they've been to the Continental Club. It's not so much about being there. Pictures there didn't happen situation. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the ring is good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the bar's ringing. And, you know, we're, we're getting pretty good cover. With, so, with but some, it's kind of like being the you know the singing bears on the Splash Mountain ride at Disneyland. You know. Except <laughs> 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 like we well, get paid better than those bears, I guess. <laughs> I would have to wonder with so many tourists coming into town and. Does that at least expose more people to your music? Maybe, if, yeah. they, if they listen to it at all. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I don't know if they even know who the performer is. Right. There's, usually, there's a cluster up front that's really into it. Mm-hmm. And then there's usually a bunch along towards the you know, back third of the bar that just, you know, they're just there to drink. and mm-hmm. Or, it's, you know, they're with a corporate party and they, you know, they all got in. Yeah. You know, paid in advance by the company or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. It's uh, it's kind of a cutthroat business for the most part. They all are, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think it's any more evil than any any other business. It's just, but you got to remember, it is a business. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you find the business aspect of things tougher to deal with rather than just the songwriting? No, not really. I mean, I've been at it so long that it's pretty comfortable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What are some of the highs you've had in your career i mean with one that spans the course of so many years there's got to be some memorable one one time we were opening for jason isbell 
in Richmond, Virginia, at a place that used to be called the Mosque. Mm -hmm. It's now named after whatever tobacco company Philip Morris turned into. And I think they changed, they took, they, they got rid of the mosque name after 9-11 because they didn't want to reference anything, possibly Muslim, even though all the decor suggests that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, I don't, it was ridiculous to me. But I found, I realized I was standing on a stage where Christofferson had stood probably 30 years back when I saw my second concert that I was taken to as a I was nine years old, I guess, mm -hmm. was Christofferson, you know, right there on that stage at what was then the mosque. So that was a cool thing to finally get there. Another connection there was uh, that show was the first place I ever saw Stephen Bruton. Mm -hmm. who, uh, and he eventually, he toured with me for a couple of weeks on my first tour. Oh, wow. Uh, but he was just, you know, he was around here and was sort of, you know, big brother to all of us. And he's mm -hmm. on that wall over there. The mural. Yeah. 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 Were you uh were you coming into the shop when the mural was put up? Yeah, I was I started in I moved to town in eighty nine. Mm. And did most of most of my trade has been here. I mean I I think I bought a couple of guitars from Ray Hennig mm -hmm. down the street and there was some crossover between the staff of the two establishments. Danny Thorpe worked over there for a while and he worked here and he, he he tour managed me for a, a little while. I was, it was after my second record and the tour support had gone away and I had to tour solo. Mm -hmm. And Danny was a guitar tech here at that time. Yeah. So, so Billy let him take off and go, you know, drive around in a rent car. With, and then we drove all over lower 48 in Western Canada mm -hmm. for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, my, a lot of what I know about guitars I learned here because I, you know, I didn't used to play electric guitar very much. And then as the budget shrunk, uh, I had to do more of the work myself. So if I wanted electric guitar on the road, I had to play it myself. Right. Which meant I had to go out there and absolutely suck in front of God and everybody for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> but, it was all right. But, you know, I'd come in here, I'd buy a Telecaster and, you know, I'd do what I could with it and then maybe... Well, I want a Les Paul, I'll trade the Telecaster. I went through a bunch of guitars in and out of here over the years. Mm -hmm. Some of them I shouldn't have traded off, but that's what happens when you... That's almost always the case, right? Anything, yeah. So, yeah, Bill, uh, you know, the owner of South Austin Music, my dad, he started first getting into good, the guitar business when he worked at McCarty Music up in Wichita Falls. And that was for uh, Joan and Charlie Souther, who I guess you've had interactions with. Well, yeah, my, it was because my dad was from Archer City, which is just you know, 25 miles from Wichita Falls. And McCarty Music was there on camp. And I spent a lot of summers in Archer City. And mm -hmm. I guess I was probably 16 or so, 16 or 17. I had a melody maker that I wasn't getting along with. The neck was all wonky, and I, and I had a I had a Japanese Browning shotgun <laughs> that was, was I just couldn't get it right. Nobody, no gunsmith could straighten it out, and, and I wanted a Strat, and Charlie had a Strat I liked, and so he he took the melody maker and the shotgun in trade for the Strat, which uh, he probably beat the hell out of me on that trade. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was a three screw screw strat, which you know I didn't know in those days. I didn't know about vintage, mm. you know, pre CBS or any of that stuff. I just liked the sound of the guitar and I wanted it, so that's mm -hmm. what I played for a while. Um, but yeah, so yeah, you know, I knew Charlie McCarty mm -hmm. before I knew Billy, and it was yeah, it was kind of a, it was a pleasant surprise to find out when I came down here. Oh yeah, I'm from Wichita. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's certainly full circle because uh, you know we we interviewed my dad back here, and it was one of the earlier ones we did, and he told that story of you yeah. trading Charlie a, a shotgun for well, a strat. As, and the, the amp tech that he had that Charlie had hired at that time had been a gunsmith, so he knew <laughs> what to do with that shotgun. I guess. Yeah, it worked out well. Yeah. So the next part of the show, uh, you might find kind of interesting. What I do is kind of just ask this or that questions. And just the first one that comes to your mind, just spit it out. Like, for example, it'd be electric or acoustic, and you'd say which one you prefer. Um, yeah, I don't really have a preference. Neither, neither one? No. Neither one goes? No. What about a six-string or 12-string? Uh, 
lately I play more toil string, uh, mm -hmm. just maybe because uh, it's newer to me. It's mm. a different language. You know, you can every you know every note is a two note chord. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, you know, octave, but you have to think different. You have to slow down a little bit. So, mm -hmm. you know, same with baritone. Baritone has big, low, fat notes, and they're rubbed together if you play too many at once. So, you, yeah, it's, it's a different thought process. Yeah. What about uh, when you're leaving the house? Would you rather be uh, in style or in comfort? Comfort. Comfort always. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Would you I've rather ever been in style? Ever. <laughs> you have it? No. I would disagree. That shirt's pretty kick kicking. Yeah, but it's not the style. It might be my style on a given day, but. Yeah. I hear you. In the style suggests so with it, you know, with mm -hmm. the scene. Yeah, I, I suppose so. So maybe just, you know, nice clothes or comfortable clothes would comfortable. be the. Yeah. yeah, good stuff. What about when you're writing a song? Would you rather it be on pen and paper or computer? Computer. Mm hmm. When did you make the transition from the two? Um, well, I still go back and forth. It's mm -hmm. like sometimes I can't finish a song unless it's on a legal pad. Yeah. But I wrote one whole record on an iPhone 3. Oh, wow. Because it had that notes app that looked like a legal pad. Yeah. But it was fast and you could carry it anywhere. Yeah. What about, would you rather watch a TV show or like TV series or a movie? Neither. I don't watch much of anything anymore because I don't like a story fed to me at somebody else's pace. <laughs> and, like, and I don't read that much either. I'll read one book a year because when I read, everything else has to stop. Mm -hmm. I think I used to like movies better in the 70s. If, and if I watch something, it's probably an old you know, 60s or 70s movie because they took their time. Mm. You'd have these long, slow scenes and shots that went on forever, and there might just be expressions. And I was I was clicking through. I was on the road, and that, the only time I ever watch TV is in a motel room. And it always frustrates me because I'm like, you know, it's either doesn't interest me or it's cutting too fast. Or, and I stumbled onto Peter Bogdanovich's Saint Jack, which was he made that in about '79. And it's Ben Gazzara in Singapore, and there's all these just long shots of just Gazzara just smoking a cigar, staring at something. Mm -hmm. But his face changes and things, you know. And you could do that then. And nowadays, I guess we don't have the attention span. Mm -hmm. And so everything's quick cuts and short shots, and mm -hmm. it just drives me crazy. It's, it's like it's like the visual equivalent of Chuck E. Cheese's or something. <laughs> <It's> overstimulation. <laughs> watching a seizure happen on the tv screen yeah. essentially yeah. yeah yeah i could agree for sure you watch any sports baseball uh i watch the pennant races i okay. don't really care who wins but there's something about the vibe mm -hmm. that i like mm -hmm. would you rather go camping or stay at a hotel in the city depends on what i'm doing um, if i'm hunting i'd rather be camping mm -hmm. <laughs> but i've done it both ways <laughs> yeah sometimes i stay in a motel six and get up yeah. Go to the lease. <laughs> you go hunting? What do you hunt for? Whitetails and uh, I used to hunt turkeys a good bit. I just missed another turkey season because uh, yeah. I tend to be busy in April. And um, feral hogs there every once in a while. Okay. That's Do exciting. I, you know, I think I hunted doves one day last year. Yeah. But yeah, I used to be much more avid about it. but. Mm -hmm. Too lazy now. I hear you. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking think about myself. it more than I do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about uh, snacks? You like spicy or regular? Spicy. Yeah. yeah. Hot Cheetos. Um, I had a, rats don't eat Cheetos, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can tell you, they, they, if they leave the, the snack racks out in the Continental Club in the middle of the night, you know they'll eat the che the potato chips and everything else, but they will not touch the Cheetos. Really. <laughs> Really? I have it not could, heard this It could before. be the packaging. I don't know. Wow. <laughs> I got a bag of hot Cheetos at my house right now. I might have uh, to throw them away. <laughs> <laughs> the rats won't even touch them. Put them in a rat trap and see what happens. <laughs> Gibson or Martin? Gibson. I really like Guild. I don't, I don't really play either. Mm. I play mostly Guilds. Love Guild here. Well, Guilds and Fenders and PRS. Yeah. You like reading a book or listening to an audio book? Reading. I don't yeah. Know. What kind of genre of books do you like? Uh, 
I think I seem to read more nonfiction, mm -hmm. travel books, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Or historical nonfiction. You like playing big venues or small venues better? I like about a 500 seater. Yeah? Yeah. Would that be considered big or small? It's kind of intermediate. Yeah, yeah. right there in the middle. Yeah. If I just had to pick the two, I'd say small. I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't like theaters. Um, I, I like sheds, and like with a standing audience. Mm -hmm. Those three thousand cm cap sheds are really cool because even if you're the opening act, there's no assigned seating, so you'll have three thousand people on the downbeat of the first song for the opener. Mm -hmm. That's the best gig you can get. Yeah, opening for Jason Isbell in a shed. Yeah. That's what you want. Yeah. You do the same, you know, we've also opened for them in theaters, and that's different because, you know, you got people filing in, being ushered in while you're on your second song. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's an art. Yeah. You like yeah. finger picking or playing with picks more? Uh, I, I flat pick, mostly. Flat pick? Yeah. There was another thing, you know, with those big venues, even if you're the you're headlining, just the sound gets so soupy. Mm. It's hard to control. You can either turn up really loud and crush it, or play really soft, mm -hmm. really quiet. So every you know, less is more. Mm -hmm. It's just tricky. You know, I like the clubs better. You've been playing the Compton Mills Club for two decades. I got to imagine that's one of your favorites to play at. It is. Yeah. Well, and it doesn't sound great in there. Yeah. <laughs> the vibe is good. It's a box, you know. So you got a standing wave. Um, mm -hmm. the, the gallery upstairs actually sounds a lot better. Mm. It's tiny, it's a 50-seat 50, 50 cap, uh, tiny little PA on a stick kind of thing, but the room sounds so good it doesn't matter because mm. it's all wood, it's all broken surfaces, you know, angles, there's, mm -hmm. there's no standing wave anywhere in that room. Yeah, that's that's nice for sure. You like Austin or Nashville better? Austin. Yeah. Though, I haven't spent that much time in Nashville lately. Um, but I think Austin will always be a better place for me. Mm -hmm. It's just gotten so high-rised. Yeah. Yeah, we can see it from this window here. Yeah. It's the well, skyline. you can't see the mural over here anymore because they built a building in front of it. Mm -mm. Yeah, yeah. Live music capital of the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, more like the tech company capital of the world. Yeah. More so these days. Yeah. What about uh, drinking? You like cocktails or beer? Beer. Yeah. Always been that way? Mm, yeah, pretty much. Red wine, more so. Mm. I find myself trying to find the right kind of wine. What would you suggest, beginner wine drinker? Uh, Malbec. Malbec? Yeah, you can, you can usually find a Malbec that's at least drinkable. Mm. <laughs> What's it, like 20, 30 bucks a bottle, or is it more expensive? Well, it depends on what you want. Yeah. And generally, you don't want to go too cheap. Don't go under 10 bucks. Oh, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Sounds good. James, I can't thank you enough for coming here today and doing this with us. It's a pleasure to get to know a little bit more about you. Thank you. And uh, explore the, the process behind your writing. Like I said, you're a prolific writer, and anytime you listen to one of James McMurtry's songs, you can expect a, a story for sure. So. Well, glad to see it that way. <laughs> yes, sir. Very enjoyable. Right. And uh, I think before we let you go, if you don't mind, we'll have you play something real quick. Yeah, I'll we'll do that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, James. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, Seth. A section in the short grass at the foot of the plains Grows broom weed in the dry times of ragweed when it rains That's all she's got left that the lawyers don't claim Jackie does her damn best, never one to complain She's been green breaking horses when she's home from the road Waiting on dispatch to find her a load She leased all but the trap Ponies can't graze a thing Another bobtail, a coastal Ought to last them till spring There were pictures on the tables And kids running around 
four generations of a blinking light town It was a cotton eye joke Or maybe just the right glance She got to go in with Randy at the Friday night dance Just got two rules that my conscience be known Don't lie to me, don't bring me nothing home Faithful's a nice word in a Sunday school class Life's just too crazy for that And he says not to worry, he'll feed while she's gone She got the freight liner idling half up on his lawn He don't like her driving when the northers come blue But if the horses went hungry, Lord knows what she'd do Around Christmas up the Cap Rock, you can see all the towns And the courthouses lit up for ten miles around It's a magical time to be traveling the roads Watch the country roll by in the halogens glow Just got two rules that my conscience be known Don't lie to me, don't bring me nothing home Faithful's a nice word in the Sunday school class Life's just too crazy for that Jackknife on black ice with an oversized load There's a white cross in the bar ditch where she went off the road She wasn't going that fast, the responders all say How it ended that bad We can wonder all day Just got two rules that my conscience be known Don't lie to me, don't bring me nothing home Faithful's a nice word in Sunday school class Life's just too short for all that Just got two rules that my conscience be known Don't lie to me, don't bring me nothing home Faithful's a nice word in Sunday school class Life's just too short for all that Life's just too short for all that